This lecture is going to go over what I think are the three biggest wins of using Docker. They're what I came up with after having worked with Docker over the last two years on both my own projects and having helped some of my consulting clients Dockerize their web applications. The wins here affect solo developers deploying to one server all the way to organizations looking to ship complex web apps to hundreds or even thousands of servers with large teams of developers. Personally, I first looked into using Docker for my own use case of wanting to deploy a single web app to a single server. Okay, let's get into Docker's three biggest wins. The first one is helping you save both time and money. Docker is really efficient when it comes to using your system's resources to help you isolate and manage your applications. And what I mean by isolation is, Docker lets you run an application on a specific machine in a way where it won't meddle with other apps on the same machine. This machine could be your development laptop or a server on the cloud. Imagine the scenario where you're a web developer and you have 12 different apps that you've developed over the years. Each one has its own set of dependencies. These apps could be written in Rails, Node.js, Django, or any other language or web framework. It doesn't matter. Virtual machines can help you isolate all those applications, but at what cost? You need to lug around a massive guest operating system for each application, and that's a tremendous amount of wasted resources. Perhaps somewhere down the line, you've heard of people talk about using Vagrant to isolate apps. But under the hood, it's just managing a virtual machine for you. The wastefulness is still there. If you don't know what Vagrant is, don't worry about it. It's just a tool that lets you create and manage virtual machines on the command line. Well, that's mostly true. Technically, Vagrant has a provider that lets you manage Docker containers too, but that's not important, and we won't be using any of that in this course. It's completely unnecessary. Anyways, back to wasting resources. Imagine your poor SSD on your development box if you are managing a dozen projects for all of your clients and personal projects with Vagrant. The problem is, each one of these Vagrant boxes might be 700 megs in size. If you factor in having 12 projects, that's going to be about 8.5 gigs of hard drive space taken up to keep everything in isolation. The more projects you have, the faster your disk space is going to get eaten up. Docker fixes that problem, and here's how. Let's say that you wanted to run those 12 web apps with Docker instead. Instead of duplicating everything, Docker will intelligently share the common ground between these projects. You may end up only paying the disk space cost for each project's package dependencies and unique data. It's impossible to gauge the exact savings because every application is different, but a 10x improvement on disk space alone isn't out of the question. We'll go over how this is possible by the time you finish this course. And then there's always production. If you were renting 100 servers on the cloud, wouldn't you want to ensure that you use all of your resources rather than waste it on virtual machine overhead? With virtual machines, you could be throwing away hundreds or even thousands of dollars per month due to wasted resources. Now let's talk about how you can save time. Docker is very efficient. Instead of having to provision a virtual machine and wait 30 seconds for it to boot up, your Docker containers will happily start in milliseconds. Realistically, that means you can start up a multi-service web application with one command in about two seconds flat. And I'm not just talking about a Hello World app here too. This is spinning up an entire stack of services like two Rails apps, a Node.js API server, Postgres, Redis, Elasticsearch, and so on. I know, I know, being able to have near instant feedback like that is going to cut into your guilt-free YouTube searches while your virtual machine used to load, but that's the price you have to pay for being awesome. And I'm sure some of you might be thinking, I don't use VMs, I use my programming languages version manager and install one copy of Postgres directly onto my laptop. Yep, I've been there, done that. And that leads us to the next win of Docker, which is portability across machines and environments. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten a new job or tried to run a project that you cloned off of GitHub, but you couldn't get it to work right off the bat. We all know this story. First, it involves reading a tome of documentation while typing in dozens of incantations like an elvish wizard. If you accidentally forget a step, you end up with obscure errors that even a ninth degree neckbeard can't debug without starting over from the beginning. After struggling for hours and restarting many times, 
you finally reach out to a senior developer or a project manager. You explain you've been following their installation documentation all day, but you just can't get it to work. The first thing they say is, well, it works for me. Are you sure you're following the steps correctly? Try once more and then get back to me. Obviously, they roll their eyes at you while saying that. Because clearly, it's your fault, right? I mean, they can't possibly comprehend that their documentation is out of date or there's a mistake in either the docs or the source code that prevents new installations from working properly. Still, you remain calm and give it a shot. As expected, it fails, so you go over to Mr. Senior Developer and let him know. He looks up at you with a now what expression on his face, and while loudly chewing his gum, he says, Hey man, I don't know what the problem is. Look here, it's running on my machine. Look, we'll go over it together on Monday and fix your mistakes. And this is where human instinct is begging to come out and play. Now, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not a violent person, but I think at this point it's completely fine to fantasize about crushing his larynx with a vice grip. You've wasted an entire day and you're still not up and running. You've also been put into a horrible mood for the weekend. It's a lose-lose situation. I'll avoid boring you with the gory details on the rest of the story, but let's wrap things up by saying that on Monday, you come in and eventually troubleshoot the error. It's because one of the developers forgot to version lock a dependency, and now there's a conflict because when you installed everything, it pulled the latest version which isn't compatible with what's running on everyone else's machine. This issue hasn't reached production yet because it's been a while since a deploy was ran. If you can believe it, this story isn't made up. I've seen this exact problem and many other environment-related problems come up time and time again. Maybe next time it's because your development machine is running macOS Sierra and the installation instructions expect you to be running Linux. Or perhaps your development box is running Ubuntu 16, but the installation instructions only work for Ubuntu 14 due to slightly different dependencies or subtle discrepancies between packages. Long story short, there's dozens of very real scenarios that create situations where something might work for you, but it doesn't work in production or your buddy's laptop. Docker eliminates these problems because your application gets neatly tucked away into a special type of package and then gets ran under whatever environment you decide to choose in a thing called a Docker file. That means your fully packaged application can be running under a specific version of Linux even if the machine running Docker is using Windows macOS, or a different distribution of Linux. This allows you to do some really interesting things, and that leads us to the third biggest win, which is using whatever technology fits best, or simply put, the best tool for the job. Once the burden of having to install an application and its dependencies are removed, then you can become much more aggressive with trying out new technologies. If you've ever worked with Ruby or Python, then you know how troublesome it can be to set up a working development environment. You may even be discouraged from trying them out because you have vivid memories of you failing for two days while you tried to get RVM or something similar working. So you've trained yourself to only stick with technologies that are familiar to you. Being free to choose whatever technology works best for your project is very empowering. It lets you experiment with new web frameworks and services without having to feel the pains of installation complications or feeling like you're polluting your main system with a bunch of services that you may not use. For example, I've been recently teaching myself Elixir. I was able to get the latest version of Elixir up and running in my development environment within two minutes of running a single command. That's two minutes to go from not having Elixir installed to having a version controlled instance of Elixir running in a REPL. Also, 90% of that time was spent waiting for the download to finish on my average cable connection. The best part is, the pattern to do this can be repeated for most languages and services. Ruby, Python, Node.js, Golang, and dozens of other programming runtimes all have very similar installation instructions. You can try them out in minutes, and if you decide that you don't like it, then all you have to do is run one command to delete everything. There's no annoying process of having to hunt down a million installation files to ensure that you really removed everything. Oh, and if you're wondering, Yes, you can have multiple versions of a single programming language installed at the same time with Docker. It's no sweat and very straightforward. You'll never have to deal with a programming language's version manager ever again, such as RVM, Virtual Env, NVM, and so on. Over the years of having used Docker, 
I feel like it has also helped me create better architectures for my applications. Now I design my apps in such a way that I know I'm free to try new things out. That encourages me to create smaller applications that talk to each other over an API rather than create a monolith. Now, I'm actually not one of those diehard people who thinks monoliths are horrible and you should have 700 microservices running from day one or you're a newbie not prepared for web scale. However, for some projects, it does make a lot of sense to write small parts of your application in a different web framework than the rest of your app. And Docker makes this easier for you in the end. I no longer see having extra runtime dependencies and services as a burden, and I'm free to pick the best tools for the job. In the end, Docker saves you time and money, makes your code more portable, and lets you use the best tools for the job. It's a win-win-win situation. Now let's move on to the next lecture, where I'll talk a little bit about why I got started with Docker. I'll see you there.